What I learned was that her long-term focus is on the anthropological study of media representations. Her work on women divers had begun through an interest in the way these divers were depicted in media related to tourism in Japan. Her turn toward Kurosawa then is actually a kind of return. She's sharing with us today a part of her continuing work on Kurosawa. The title of her work is Where the Heart Goes Astray, Guilt and Responsibility in Dashomon and Ikiru. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. And, um, and I must thank the Center for Japanese Studies for having made my stay so pleasant um, so far. Now, I, I have to switch back and forth between the um, PowerPoint and, and the DVD because I brought over British DVDs, sorry, and they don't work back there. So there may be a bit of technical fiddling about, but um, I hope it'll be all right. Right. So. In my discussion of Ikeru today, um, Kurosawa's 1952 film, whose title means, of course, to live, I would like to pick up the theme. Um, uh, I, I, would, um, I, I, I thought when I first was asked to do this that I would pick up the theme of um, guilt and responsibility from Rashomon, about which I've written quite extensively. And my immediate reaction was that Ikaru nor it for clearly formed a pair with Rashomon the film that Kurosawa had made two years before, and which, as you know, won the Grand Prix at Venice in 51. When I went back to look at what others had written about the film, I found that this was not such an original insight on my part, as it always goes when you're an academic and you think, ah, brilliant idea. Um, Goodwin notes the similar visual techniques. Birch is struck by the shared narrative structures and, um, and strategies. And this is very important to keep in mind. Both Rashomon and Ikaru have very complicated narratives to do with flashbacks. And I'll show you um, a very nice um, sort of uh, diagram that Goodwin put together later on so we can get to grips with the plot. Um, and there are spoilers. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, and Desser, in particular, makes the point most clearly. Um, but before that, I will also say that I very much want you to think about the way um, Ikeru, right there in 1952, sort of is in the middle of what I think of as Kurosawa's post-war films. And I'm going to come back to post-war and post-war themes. But anyway, Desu makes the point most clearly about ra the, the similarities between Rashomon and um, 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 Ikeru and other Kurosawa films. He notes that Ikeru borrows, problematizes issues raised in Drunken Angel and Rashomon. With Drunken Angel, the question shared is, what does it mean to be a hero in modern times under ordinary circumstances? And the problem raised by Rashomon that the films share is how to live in an existential world, a world rendered meaningless by the death of certainty, by the death, that is, of God. Now, I'm not going to agree with the death of God part. It doesn't work for me within a Japanese context at all. I don't think it works for me in, in terms of, of Kurosawa's life. He said in an interview at one point that his religion was totally separate from his filmmaking. And although he doesn't elaborate on that, at least implies that he had some sort of religious feeling. And we can't think about the death of God. I mean, Buddhism and Shintoism are so complicated um, to think about in Japan. It just does not um, speak to the issue. But I'm convinced that the death of certainty is an important theme throughout Kurosawa's work, and that his concern with this topic arises out of a series of events, but I want to kind of pull out three events, two of which he discusses in his autobiography, and the third to which he alludes um, only in his autobiography. So these three events are um, wandering the streets of Tokyo after the 1923 earthquake with his brother Hego. Kurosawa did this when he was just 13. And um, he said his brother told him at that time, you must look at the things you're afraid of. You must look them at, at them directly. Um, and the second um, event is the period of time spent living with his brother in a Tokyo slum. So if you can imagine that, 
um, as a vibrant kind of ghetto area. Um, Kurosawa lived there for a few years um, when he was trying his best to be a leftist activist, which he also describes as having failed at. But we have to keep in mind he did, he did start um, his young adult life as a kind of activist and on the left. And then finally, the third event, I would argue, is the Second World War itself. The first event, the Tokyo earthquake, is described graphically, visually, in his autobiography. The people who stood to the left and right of me, he says, in this scene looked for all the world like fugitives from hell, and the whole landscape took on a bizarre and eerie aspect. And um, this kind of looking at things directly in the face, I think, is relevant for Ikaru um, because it, his brother told him to look at it. And it's relevant for Ikaru because he says Ikaru grew out of his own concern and fear to do with death. So he's trying to look squarely at the ideas of death in, in Ikaru. The second event um, was this period of time spent living in a Tokyo slum, and his description of the people he came to know while living there includes his um, admiration for their optimism and humor, an admiration that went hand in hand with the knowledge that sympathy was of no help at all. He tells the story of a young girl who was beaten daily by her stepmother, and then he went to try and rescue her at one point to untie her because she was left tied every day while her stepmother went out. And the girl said, no, 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 leave me because she'll just beat me more if she finds me untied. And that kind of gave him a sense of, of pessimism he thinks is very important. And the third event, that of the Second World War, um, he only mentions in passing, but I think it's a quite significant um, paragraph. He says, and I quote, I offered no resistance to Japan's militarism. Unfortunately, I have to admit that I did not have the courage to resist in any positive way, and I only got by, ingratiating myself when necessary and otherwise evading censure. I am ashamed of this, but I must be honest of it. So let's think about how this relates to my discussion of Ikiru today. I would like to pick up the theme of the death of certainty and relate it to uh, what I see as key tropes that we can find throughout the work of Kurosawa. And I think these um, key tropes are responsibility and guilt, the problems of responsibility and guilt. We can say if there is no certainty, then how is it possible to feel guilt and have responsibility if things aren't certain and everything's changing and it's all relative, you know, what does it matter? Um, and I think this question for Kurosawa arises um, especially in relationship to modern urban life. Second, I will discuss the importance of women as catalysts. And thirdly, I want to discuss the significance of what's usually called the sort of um, senior-junior relationship, but I like to think of in, in Kurosawa's films as the mentor or parent relationship with the student or child. These all link up to the quotation from Desser about how one might act heroically in modern life. The answer provided in Ikaru requires that we contextualize the film as a profoundly post-war work, much like Stray Dog made three years before. That is, there's an absent presence in Stray Dog, Rashomon, and Ikaru, um, which is that of the occupying US Army. Many people have noted this. But there's also an absence of any direct, and note I say direct, discussion of responsibility for the war. I think there are, there are indirect discussions. In taking this line, I'm following the film scholar Yoshimoto, who argues that most of the general film studies work on Kurosawa misses the sorts of readings that experts on Japanese film history might bring to bear, such as issues of censorship, of genre conventions, and attempts to overturn these conventions, and most importantly, the taken-for-granted context that an immediate post-war generation might bring to the reading of Kurosawa's films. And it's here where, as an anthropologist, I think I have something to say. Now, I want to talk about the possibility of post-war heroes, and I'd like to begin very briefly by talking about Stray Dog. Um, of the three films uh, I've mentioned so far, Rashomon, Ikaru, and Stray Dog, only Stray Dog obliquely alludes to the issue of responsibility, although it, it really um, looks at the issue of war, right? in a discussion of the post-war generation. So what I'm going to do is show you a short clip from that and then take it up. And it should be all set to go. And I'll, I'll, I'll contextualize it for you in a moment, but, but I want you to see the clip. Uh, 
さん男もひどいね人間も少ないじゃないなあれは汚いものには宇治が分かってもんかな世の中には悪人はいない悪い環境があるだけだそんなことがないですが自殺とかも考えてみれば可哀想ですねカンカンそういう考えが俺たちには気になった犯人ばかりを今っていうとよくそんな錯覚を起こすが一匹の狼のために傷ついたたくさんの人手を忘れちゃいかんのあの狼の半分は死刑囚だが大勢の幸福を守ったという確信があらした刑事なんて全く救われない犯人の心理分析なんて小説家に任しとくんだな俺は単純にあいつらを憎む悪いやつは悪い僕はまだどうもそういうふうに考えられないんですよ長い間先生につらい間に人間たちがごく簡単な理由で毛玉の女などを何回も見てきたもんですからきっと僕も年齢の差かな通常の時代の差かななんとか言ったねあっそれであっそれでそれそれそれその戦後発ってやったや君は遺産の相関し君には遺産の気持ちが分かりすぎるんだそうかもしれませんね僕も福井の時手書の中で10個盗まれたんですよおおひどく無茶なドキドキしい気持ちになりましてねあの時だったら強盗が平気でやれたでしょでもここが案内回り方だと思って僕は逆のコースを選んで今の仕事しがいたんですつまりアプレゲルそのアプレゲルにも2種類あるんだな君みたいなのとウサみたいなそういうのは本物だよウサみたいなのはそのアプレガエルいやアプレゲル Okay.、Um, stray dog, in case you don't know, it is the story of a police detective who has his gun stolen and then goes after the criminal who、um, is using his gun to kill people. And in Stray Dog, we get、um, uh, Mifune Toshiro at his most handsome, and he's usually wandering around in a white suit in case we had any doubts about him being a bad,、uh, good guy or a bad guy. Um, now, I've been looking at this film within the context of the、uh, film noir genre for a different paper I'm trying to write. And I think that for the Kurosawa, the, the film noir protagonist, and his problematic masculinity and identity was part of his concern with modern Japanese masculine identities.、Um, so the handsome young Murakami. Is the other side of the coin, as you saw, of the very criminal he's hunting. Both were soldiers in the war, both had their knapsacks stolen,、um, both had to remake themselves in the light of this theft. And so we need to think what might the knapsack represent. But I'm not talking about Stray Dog today, so I'll just leave it as a question for you. But it sim obviously symbolizes something important. And both have become involved with the same woman during their wanderings in Tokyo's underworld. The police officer, who's the alter ego of his criminal friend, brother, or fellow soldier, is a common post war figure. You get him in film and novels all the time. And so I don't need to say much more about it. But Yoshimoto knows something very interesting、um, that he thinks modern and Western audiences might not see in when they look at Stray Dog. And that is that there's a problem with the representation of the calm, humorous, and humane Detective Sato, who you saw talking with、um, Mifune there,、um, who's Murakami's mentor. At the very start of the scene that we've just seen,、um, when he arrives at Sato's house, Murakami admires the certificates of merit that line the walls in Sato's home. These certificates go 25 years back to 1924, and Yoshimoto argues that a 1949 Japanese audience would have asked itself what sort of man was Sato really? If he was a good, commendable police officer while he enforced the laws of Japan's increasingly militaristic、um, government during the、um, late 1920s up through 1945, how has he survived the regime change? And what does this survival mean?、Um, thus, we're confronted by a lacuna uncertainty.、Um, is Sato really a good man? If so, was he always a good man? 
Um, and has the definition of a good man changed in any way? Similarly, what exactly did Murakami do during the war? We never ask ourselves. He's the good guy in this film. We don't ask ourselves what sort of soldier he was, but he's very keen to follow and obey orders. Now, I'm not going to discuss this film, but I want to pick this point up because a similar question could be asked of the main um, character in um, Ikeru, Wantanabe, the, the civil servant, um, played by Shimura Takeshi. It is 1951, and he's worked as a government bureaucrat since 1921. And his son, Mitsuo, was a soldier during the war. So again, we need to ask ourselves what sort of men these men are. It could be imagined that these men survive by keeping their heads down and are guilty of allowing fascism to arise. The oft-repeated, particularly during the Second World War, Edmund Burke quotation notes that all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. But it does not tell us what might happen to those good men after evil has triumphed and then been defeated. Kurosawa, I would like to argue, as with many artists of his generation, I think felt compelled to wrestle with this question through perhaps an ancillary query. One once defined as good citizens, the Japanese, in losing the war, were branded as somehow complicit and thus guilty. So is redemption necessary or is it even possible? Or better still, I think Kurosawa asks, how is redemption possible, particularly in the light of a lack of certainty? This might seem an odd question to ask of the members of a society famous, famously described by the anthropologist Ruth Benedict as being part of a shame, not a guilt culture, i.e. it's all external and not internalized. Um, we, and I think this is hugely problematic because this depiction of Japanese society ignores um, 1,500 years of Buddhist influence in which guilt plays a large part. Buddhism is big on guilt and sin and punishment. Buddhist religious sects spend much time teaching the Japanese how to make merit and to avoid suffering in the afterlife, as in the, as the scroll depicts, um, where sinners are being speared and made to swallow molten copper. So there was a discourse within Japan, an ongoing discourse, about assuming responsibility for one's actions and, and um, the problem of sin. Thus, Kurosawa's experience of the earthquake as a vision of hell, as I've mentioned, and the beginning of Rashomon, the famous beginning um, of Rashomon, with um, that destroyed gate, perhaps reminding us of the Tokyo earthquake, but also references to life having become a sort of hell on earth, are kind of all, I would say, are all grounded in a religious doctrine that attempted, as did Confucian ideology, to teach men how to be good social beings. So I think it's, I think it is a real problem, this, this problem of, of guilt. It's not something I'm importing. Of course, Rashomon raises these issues through what I have termed a very black joke. That is, filmed during the Tokyo war crime trials and alluding to them, as many have noted, through the camera acting um, as the eyes of the occupation. We sit as, um, as all the members tell their story, uh, as all the, um, the bandit and, and the medium and, and Masago, the wife, tell their story in the place of the judge or next to the judge. We never see the judge. Um, we, we, um, we sit in that place of judgment, and yet, the question is, what happens if you're sitting in judgment and everybody says, I'm guilty, I did it? How do you get at the truth when everybody tells you a different story and, and is absolutely convinced that it's true? So this is the surrealistic aspect to uh, Rashomon. It's impossible to determine the truth. Who, who committed the murder? Um, I think Rashomon, in some ways, is one of the first postmodern films, um, and, and we could talk about the uncertainty of late modernity and, and begin by looking at Rashomon, but we're not here to talk about that today. But if I were to ask you who the hero of this film is, you'd be hard put to tell me. Was it the murdered husband? He was a bit of a coward and a bit lame. Was it the priest? Well, he's lost his faith. The bandit? Not, not really. Um, um, is it the city dweller? No, he's also a thief. The woodcutter? Well, Richie argues that he might be the murderer, and he probably is the thief who's taken the dagger. And certainly, we wouldn't say it's the wife. Women were rarely heroines in Kurosawa's films in the sense of being the psychological center of the story, but they can behave heroically, and I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Um, 
she seems too contradictory, Masago, and complex for us to define her as heroic, although I've argued elsewhere that the depiction of her in Rashomon is a representation of woman as a sign that remains unreadable and unknowable, the illusion that structures our social reality. But if instead of looking for godlike heroes, we ask, if even good men have done evil by keeping their heads down and not resisting fascism, for example, how can they then go on to act heroically? How might they atone for their having done nothing or having stolen a dagger in Rashomon? In this case, given that the woodcutter watched the rape of the wife and did not intervene, and this is very important, most people forget that Rashomon is the story about a woman who's raped, um, and that we are made complicit in that rape because we're with the camera and we stand there next to the woodcutter and watch it happen and nobody does anything, right? Um, and Kurosawa said this, he said, this is a film about a rape. He didn't focus on the murder that much at all. Um, the woodcutter is very complicit in this, but it is he who finds redemption by taking in a small baby at the film's end. So if there's a heroic act in the film, it, or a possibility of heroism, it's the adoption of a small child by a very, very poor man. Um, and this small and insignificant seeming action, one that Donald Ritchie dubs a sentimental, um, I think is Kurosawa's answer to the question of how to be heroic in modern times, not through big epic seeming deeds, but through acts of kindness that may well reverberate into the future. And lots of people talk about how he shares this kind of interest in redemption and good deeds with Dostoevsky, who Kurosawa himself um, talked about as a major influence. And women and, and young children or young men feature quite strongly as possible paths through redemption in Kurosawa films. I'll just mention women, if you think of films like One Wonderful Sunday, High and Low, The Bad Sleep Well, and Sanjuro, um, and then if you think of possible children as, as figures who help um, in redemption, High and Low again, The Seven Samurai, Yojimbo, and I would even add a Rhapsody in August. But I want to talk about women a bit. Um, before I do that, I just thought we should run through um, the film for those of you who don't know it well. Um, this is a brilliant diagram from Goodwin, which I had trouble scanning in, and so I had to type in. I hope it's just about readable. Um, if you look at um, Ikaru in terms of its chronological events, it's a fairly straightforward story. You've got this bureaucrat, Wantanabe, who's worked for the city government for 30 years. At the beginning of his time in, in the office, he makes a plan for efficiency that's ignored. His wife dies. He thinks maybe he should remarry for his son's sake, but he doesn't. And over the years, as his son grows up, and you see his son growing up in baseball games, and his son has an operation for appendicitis, and then his son goes off to war, he increasingly becomes what, the office mummy. He becomes sort of ossified in his job. Then 30 years after um, beginning his job, he has an x-ray, which tells him, um, which reveals the fact that he has cancer. He takes two weeks off of work. Um, spends a, uh, a night out with a, with a writer who n is never given a name. Then he pursues a young woman named Toyu, um, um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. He goes back to the office, and he spends his last five months trying to get a playground built for um, children living in a slum. Um, the park is in use at the time that he dies. Office routine resumes after his funeral. So that's the chronological order. In terms of the film, it's much more complex. You've got a voiceover narration. We never know who the voiceover narrator is at all. The film begins with his x-ray and then flashes back to a period earlier in time where a, a group of slum women put a petition in um, asking to have something done with this kind of flooded area in their neighborhood, right? Um, I'll, show, I'll show you a little clip from that in a moment. Then Wantanabe visits the clinic. He realizes he has cancer, although the doctors don't tell him this. They lie to him. And this is an interesting way in which Rashomon uh, and, and Ikaru are different. Every lie leads to the truth in Ikaru, which we don't get in Rashomon. But he, find, he realizes he has cancer. He goes home that night. And then in flashback, he remembers his wife's funeral, talking to his brother about maybe marrying again. He thinks about his son's life, baseball game, operation, departing for war. Then he takes two weeks off from the office, goes back to the office where he finds the petition about the playground. The film then jumps to five months later when he's dead. 
And at his wake, at the wake for his funeral, um, people talk about how he managed to get the playground built. So you get more flashbacks in there. Um, then everyone goes back to work in the office um, and the park is in use. So that's the, the, the structure of the film. Um, in the abstract for this paper, I noted that for both Rashomon and Ikuru, modern city life is an important aspect of the story. Um, everybody notes that Ikaru's um, yeah, the, the urban setting is extremely important. In Rashomon, I would say the city's um, an absent presence. But the polluted city, busy and bustling, and in a night scene straight out of Faust, its underworld are all clearly delineated in Ikaru. If Wantanabe is ill, um, so too is the modern city with its labyrinth bureaucracy and with the development of what um, Zimmel termed a blasé attitude to one's fellow human beings. I think there's no better symbol of this than um, the opening shot of the film, which shows Wantanabe's stomach x-ray with a tumor that can't be fixed. Um, it, Wantanabe is doomed, and as Richie has noted, he becomes defined by a cancer that is very common to men in Japan. So far, so ordinary. More importantly, and what I think many audiences may miss, is that it's cancer of the stomach. That is, he has a cancer that affects the part of his body, the belly or hara, most associated with feeling, intuition, instinctive action, and the understanding of one fellow's human, human beings. Harage is that quiet understanding where you don't have to speak words. While the heart or the kokoro is the seat of knowledge, and that's what goes astray in Rashomon, in Ikaru, it is the seat of feeling that is affected. Not for nothing has the young office worker Toyo um, um, and that's her on the bottom there, on, on your right-hand side, um, nicknamed um, Wantanabe, the mummy, right? He's mummified. He still thinks and functions, but he's grown deficient in what we might call in English, for lack of a better term, his soul, um, in, all, in all the nuanced meanings of soul. It's strangely appropriate that the cancer is in his belly. This makes his Faustian evening out with the novelist an inverted joke, Wantanabe does not need to sell his soul to the devil. It's already gone. He's, he lost it about 30 years before, or over a 30-year period of time, doing this soul-destroying work. It's been affected by his wife's death and his total dedication to raising his son, Mitsuo. And I think it's telling that his last memory, as he reviews his, um, his life um, in that first flashback sequence, is of seeing his child going off to war. Uh, it's not just Wantanabe, perhaps, who's lost his soul, but also Mitsuo, whom we first meet as he discusses with his wife, Kaz, um, how to get money for a new house out of his father. He and his wife are shown as whining, complaining, grasping young modern consumers. They only care about money and status, it seems. They too, Mitsuo especially, seem devoid in the area of fellow human being. Every time Watanabe starts to try and tell his son he has cancer, the son does something off-putting and cold and hostile that, that keeps him quiet. Part of this lack of humanity, as it develops in Kurosawa's work, is due to the expansion of what Kurosawa saw as a modern Western lifestyle in Japan, um, with the emphasis of, of perhaps on individu individualism. But I think that for a 1952 audience, it would all, there would also be a question about whether such a hardness, on the son's part particularly, grows out of the experience of war. Um, so if delving into the pleasures of the flesh, which Wantanabe um, does one, one evening, um, does not offer him anything he wants, how is he going to find redemption? How will he regain his soul? This is um, shown to happen in two ways in the film. Um, the first is through the intervention of the women from the neighborhood. And this is where I have to fiddle with things and hope we don't waste too much time. Um, and I just want to show you the clip of, of these women. Um, okay. Let's see if we can get that going. Um, these women have come to make a petition. Mm, let's see. Uh, okay, there we are. They've come to make a petition. Uh, I don't know what scenes. Um, about getting the slum. This is, and they're given a runaround that goes on. 
for quite some time. I'm not going to show it all to you. All right. Um, but if we skip forward a couple of minutes, they're sent round from basically from pillar to post. So they, they see all these bureaucrats over months. You see their clothing change from summer to autumn to winter clothing as this goes on. Yeah. And they end up right back where they've started. All right. So they, they do this, um, and note this man Kimura, I'll come back to him eventually. Um, they do this, they put their, their um, proposal in writing, and it lands um, back on Wantanabe's desk where it actually began. Now, as I said, he's not there that day. He's in hospital learning um, from a fellow patient rather than a doctor about his illness. In shock at the diagnosis, he stays away from work for about two weeks. And it's only through the intervention of young Toyo that he is saved. She tracks him down to get his signature, um, uh, or stamp really, on her resignation form, and finds him the morning after this night of debauchery. The only real remnant of the night is um, his light-colored hat, which becomes symbolically important. It's the hat totally unsuited to be worn by a civil servant with his dark suits. But um, so the hat perhaps begins to represent a change in Wantanabe, but it's up to um, Toyo to teach him how to change his feelings or um, we might say his hara. It's not a simple process because the first thing Wantanabe does is he reaches out to Toyo in a way that's almost pathetic. He takes her out to buy stockings, then out for a day that parallels the night out he's had. They almost do the same sort of things, but in daylight and in nicer places. Um, and finally, he takes her to tea. She's poor and clearly hungry, but full of good um, humor and high spirits. And she tells him jokes about her fellow office workers about to be ex-workers and tells them all the nicknames she's created for them, including the fact that she calls him the mummy. At one point, Wantanabe, um, who's spending more and more time with Toyo, takes her to dinner and tells her about his son. But she berates him when he, plays, he blames his 30 years of stifling work as part of the price he's paid to raise his son as a widower on his own. She says to him, why do parents want their children to be grateful? They did not ask to be born. If there's something wrong with Mitsuo, if he's cold and distant, Wantanabe should shoulder some blame for this. But Toyo also sees something we might not have noted. She says to him, you love your son best of all. And almost shamefaced, Wantanabe agrees. He kind of looks away and nods. Soon Toyo um, begins to find his attention oppressive and even a little frightening. Is he trying to make her his lover, she wonders? He finally tells her of his, of, of his illness. And I'll show you, I want to show you the clip from that because it's, I think it's an important um, clip. And we need to go back to, sorry, we need to go back to menu. Oh, somehow. This is, this is the fiddling bit where I'm, <laughs> I'm not very good at it, but OK. Um, so he's, the, uh, many people have analyzed the scene, I should tell you, um, and, and find it important. It's not just me. And one of the things they're interested in is how, um, oh, wait. 
why is that? Uh, uh, it's the wrong place. Uh, let's stop that. Let's try again. I jumped too quickly. Um, many people have analyzed this scene because they think um, it, it represents his rebirth. Um, oh dear, sorry about that. It's being too sensitive. And they like the fact that happy birthday is being sung in the background towards the end of the theme. But I'm more interested in getting you to think about this conversation he has with her, if it'll do it now. Um, and this is called misunderstood because um, he can't even talk to his son or his brother about what's wrong with him. And why won't that let me fast forward a bit? Oh, no, it won't let me get to that. I may have to um, not show it to you. I can't drag it forward. Sorry. All right, well, these things always happen in my experience. There's always something that goes wrong. In this scene, he's taken Toyu to um, a restaurant, they, and they talk about um, what he tells her he has cancer. All right, there, here he is in the restaurant. And he wants her, he says, to teach him how to live the way she does, how, how to have the vigor she does, that, that her vigor warms his heart. And she's terrified. You know, he's ill, he's dying, he's kind of leaning over her and demanding that she give him some sort of secret of life. Um, and, and she doesn't know what to do. Um, she tries to tell him to turn to his son, but Wantanabe says his son is gone. He's at some distance far away from him. And then Toyu tells him to make something. That's what she does now. She works in a factory making these toy rabbits. So the scene is set for Wantanabe's small act of heroism, the building of the playground in a Tokyo slum. Toyo does not reappear in the film, although the women of the slum neighborhood do. But I think we can't underestimate her importance. It is she who sees the truth, that Wantanabe desperately loves his child. And it is she who puts him on the path to some sort of redemption, a regaining of self of courage, of self-respect even, that will affect the people around him, some more profoundly than others. And I think if we look at Kurosawa films, and, and, and talking um, last night to, to Ken and Hitomi, I was saying, oh, maybe there should be a book on Kurosawa's women, because we don't think enough about how important women are in Kurosawa's narratives. Um, the women in, in his films, their actions often bring into focus, perhaps we could say even bring into being, the essential meaning of the narrative itself. And if you see The Seven Samurai in a few weeks' time, that scene with the women yelling at the men to do something is almost almost exactly reproduced near the beginning of the Seven Samurai. So um, women may be evil and grasping consumers and all sorts of bad things, but they can also be our conscience and the center of all that matters. It is they who think about things like love and children's well-being, and it's they who push come to shove will act. They can tempt men to wrongdoing, but they also act as moral centers, the voice of a modern um, conscience. To what end, we might ask? And it's here that I'd like to turn to the parent-child relationship. Now, when Wantanabe asks Toyo about her vigor, she replies with some alarm, I eat and move about, although the Japanese, I think she says, I work and move about, but you know, that's the subtitle. She answers his fear and uncertainty with the most fundamental of certainties. She could have added, I was born and I will die, which are the other two certainties we have in life. However, if life were as basic as that, we'd be nothing more than unthinking animals. There must be more. And Toyo reala realizes this as well when she says, I just make things, right? And shows him the toy rabbit, the manufacturer which makes her feel like kin to all the babies of Japan. It is here that she reminds us in Wantanabe of the other thing that we do, as all other um, beings do, we reproduce. However, human reproduction is not biological. I'm an anthropologist, so I have to insist on the fact that it's also social. Um, we make children into social beings, and normally this is seen to be the job in modern societies of the mother, and in Japan particularly of the mother and the education system. But in the film, Watanabe has been both mother and father to his son. He has helped make this man, as Toyu noted in an earlier scene, and cannot blame his son's coldness solely on Mitsuo, right? He, as a parent, needs to take some responsibility for Mitsuo's hardness and distance. 
Perhaps you might feel that I'm stretching a point, especially for, um, for a 21st century audience, when I say that this realization on Watanabe's part, that he loves his wounded son and remains responsible for him, may well be an allusion to the parents of Japan's post-war generation. Who but they made or allowed the conditions that led to the war? Who but they embraced um, the values that allowed their sons to go off to war with much flag-waving and patriotic fervor? Who taught their sons these values? Ikaru is as much about complicity as is Rashomon, which made us complicit through our watching of the rape. We are in the terrain occupied by what um, Carol Gluck, who's going to speak to you, I guess, in a few weeks, has called the ghost that haunts the Japanese-U.S. relationship, the Second World War. And this was an event so all-encompassing for Watanabe and Mitsuo's generations that even, as Jennifer Robertson has noted, musical theater groups, the, you know, the most mundane thing you might imagine, were involved in promoting um, patriotism and nationalism during the war. So there was a cultural amnesia necessary to rebuild during the 1950s and 60s, and this resulted in what the historian Igarashi describes as a state of being rather uh, analogous to that of a body being in pain. The social politic, the social body, was somehow in pain in Japan, and because they lost the war, they couldn't talk about it, they couldn't examine it, they couldn't do any soul-searching really about it. Building a playground for a generation of post-war baby boomers seems a small gesture towards redemption in the face of this unthinking sort of complicity and emotional as well as moral mummification. If that were all that Ikaru was about, it would not be such a masterpiece of a film. I think um, it's a great film because Watanabe's story is as much about memory as Rashomon is, but whereas in Rashomon we never get at the truth, in, in Ikero, we do. People remember and they may say one thing, but the flashbacks show us another thing. We, the audience, see the story of how Watanabe got the playground built, even through the drunken narratives of his office staff. And we see how courageous his final days were. It's at this point, though, to talk about why I think it's so great that I want to make con a connection I've not seen others make, but one of you may say, oh no, I've read an article about this. I want to identify Watanabe with um, the rabbits that Toyu makes and gives to him. Now, of course, it's the hare that we find in Japan rather than rabbits. There's only one species on an island somewhere. But the rabbit occupies an interesting place in both Buddhist narrative and Japanese folklore, both of which account for a rabbit being up there on the moon pounding mochi. There's a Buddhist story you only find in China and Japan about the moon rabbit um, who uh, Along with, and this is the Buddhist story, I'll just give it to you very quickly, um, a, a monkey and otter, a jackal and a rabbit try to make merit on the day of the full moon, and they want to do something that's very virtuous, and they meet an old man who begs for food, the monkey gathers fruits, the otter collects fish, the jackal steals some food. Um, and the rabbit doesn't know what to do. He, he can only offer grass, so he offers himself. He throws himself into the fire, sacrifices himself, um, and the rabbit doesn't get burnt when this happens. The old man is revealed to be chakra, and touched by the rabbit's virtue, he draws his likeness on the moon. So it's a, a Buddhist morality tale about self-sacrifice. Um, there are other Japanese folk tales about hares or rabbits in which they appear as a kind of counterpart to the fox, male to the fox is female. The hare is a clever, tricky character, as well as a crafty, clownish, and mischievous cat figure. I would argue that Watanabe is all of this in the film. Initially clownish, if tragic and pitiable because of his cancer, ultimately, as he fights to get the playground built and um, all his talents of intelligence and craftiness are brought to the fore, he also is a bit mischievous. He, he confronts Yakuza at one point in an interesting way. But as with the Buddhist incarnation of the rabbit, Watanabe is also a sacrificial animal, a point made by the novelist that he goes out with that one night. The novelist says, you're crucified on the cross of your cancer. The novelist says to him, Eke homo, behold the man, a clear reference to Christ. Um, and so it is that Watanabe sacrifices his last days, which he could be spend resting at home or out on the town or chasing women, um, fighting to get a playground built. But to what end? For many film studies, um, uh, media studies people, the film highlights the possibility of change, even if only at the level of bureaucracy and individual bureaucrats. Kimura, Kimura I told you to notice him in that earlier scene, um, or gelatine, as Toyo Nix names him, seems poised to act more humanely, but only poised at the film's end. The last scene shows him standing, not speaking, 
and sitting again as a new bureaucratic round, run around takes place and then sees him standing on a bridge looking down at the playground that Watanabe succeeded in building. But I'm not convinced that it's Kimura who's the person most changed by Watanabe's sacrifice. I think it's Mitsuo, his son, who is left clutching at the end of the wake, um, his father's symbolic gray hat. And I think in, the, in this discussion with his wife, he seems softer already, kind of a beginning of a change in personality. You'll have to watch it and tell me if you think the same thing. I don't think Kurosawa spells out this possible change for uh, Mitsuo. I think um, spelling it out is rather unimportant. But the theme of the young man who changes through his encounter with a wiser older man, with or without the intervention of women, occurs frequently in Kurosawa films. Sometimes the change is clear, as in Stray Dogs, Seven Samurai, or Sanjuro. Sometimes it's to no obvious avail, as in Drunken Angel. And in some films, such as Yojimbo and Ikaru, we don't know what will happen next. This is fair enough, since in 1952, it was unclear what would happen in Japan and what the war veterans back in society and doing their jobs would achieve. In hindsight, we can say they bent their will to achieving in peace what they could not do in war. But Kurosawa didn't know this in 1952. Um, all he saw was a, an unnerving continuity between past and present bureaucracy and bureaucratic servants, big business and Yakuza that seemed not to change. So where does the heart go astray? Kurosawa said that in Rashomon it was in the forest where people get lost and stripped back to their subjective selves. As Richie noted, the characters in Rashomon are locked into their roles and assume a guilt analogous to their status. A bandit kills, right? A samurai, if he's disgraced, will kill himself. A weak woman might kill her laughing husband. Um, and a wood, from the woodcutter's point of view, two silly men might fight to death over a manipulative woman. It all depends on the point of view. If there is a redemption for these characters, it may only be in death itself. Um, and I think it's interesting that, you know, death is such a big thing in Rashomon, and Ikaru, which is about death, is entitled to live, right? Um, in contrast in Ikaru, then, it's not the heart, perhaps, that goes astray. Or, um, it's just, you know, um, it goes quiet, perhaps. Um, but the hara, ill and lost in the labyrinth of the city. With it goes the ability to care about one fellow humans, one's fellow human beings. Watanabe learns to do this again. He regains his empathy and remembers his love for his son. He decides to make something before he dies and to do good, and in this lies his redemption. Whether his sacrifice is enough to profoundly change others is something I leave you to consider. I would like to end here by saying that perhaps it is time that we reconsider the work of Kurosawa Akira. In the Western film canon, he's discussed as a great film director and script writer, a true auteur, whose films transcend cultural boundaries and the era of their making. He's truly, he was truly an international artist. Not only his films, but their influence make him more worthy of being included, more than worthy of being included in the list of the world's top 10 film directors. In Britain, he's often listed five or six. Um, his films often rank in the top five. But the more I work on Kurosawa, the more I become aware that he was also quintessentially a Japanese filmmaker, and there's been a lot of contention about his Japanese identity, but I think we have to remember he was a Japanese filmmaker, an artist who should be contextualized as being of his era and very much of his generation. He was part of that pre-war Tokyo generation described most recently by the anthropologist Onuki Tierney and the historian Mirren Silverberg. They were original, daring, artistic, well-versed both in foreign and Japanese literature, films and arts, as well as being politically aware. Many of them were on the left, um, and many of them put their heads down during the war and didn't do anything. We understand Kurosawa best if we see him as part of this lost, vibrant generation. The lefty artistic liberals who, as I said, put their heads down, cooperated, and then at the war's end had to decide how to or how to not assume responsibility for their inaction. Kurosawa's art grows out of this moment, I think. Its greatness lies in the fact that it mirrors something essential about his own internal dilemmas. It speaks of the guilt and responsibility that he himself felt. His films, we might say, are part of his redemption. And I'll leave it there with you.